Call me Brendan Yuri because I have high, high hopes for the U.S. men's national team. Let's get into this. The United States and football don't mix. Then what are we doing? What's the point? Hey, I hate soccer. You do? Yeah. I can't stand soccer. I think that it's the least talented sport on earth. It does. Whoa! I don't even know what. I don't even. What? I don't even know what kind of mindset you have to have. Even when I. Even, okay, growing up. Okay. <sighs> growing up, I didn't like the sport that we call soccer. Uh, I did kind of look down on it as a sport that was more, you know, for the weak kids who couldn't make it onto the uh, football team, American football team, or the basketball team. You know, those are the those are the real athletes. You know, strength, power, athleticism, and soccer's for the weak kids who just can. You know, they they might be able to do a, amazing skills with a ball, but even at that point. Even at that point when I disliked the sport, which sadly, I disliked the sport, you know, in my high school days, I never would say it's the least talented sport on the planet. I mean, good grief. Respect to, to mixed martial artists, respect to, to combat sports that, you know, Dana White is so impassioned with. But to call, to call, I'm done. I'm done. I can't. Oh, my gosh. Care and does not understand the football culture shared by so much of the rest of the world. And if you've ever wanted to know why, then this video is the one to watch. Because by the end, you will understand football in America and how it has finally started to change. An important part of that fact, though, is that I'm not English. I'm American, actually. I grew up in American football culture, or soccer, as we call it. And through years of traveling around the world to make football videos, I have a unique perspective on how the football culture works inside the United States. States hmm. and how it contrasts the one outside of it. You see, the American sporting infrastructure is constructed differently than basically any other country in the world. Those leagues right. we spend all the time watching are made up of franchises in closed league systems, and they operate as businesses. The vast- Absolutely. Like, we have the, the breakdown between entertainment and community. I did a video about that recently. You can check that out. It's somewhere there. Um, yeah, and, and, and we, we have these- Sports that are geared towards franchises, geared toward putting out a sporting product on the field, not so much being involved as a community member of a club. Yeah, he's dead on the money with that analysis. The majority of those franchises did not start as local sporting clubs or small local entities that eventually right. naturally expanded into large sporting brands, like Arsenal, for example. It was founded by the workers at the Royal Arsenal Complex and eventually, Gunners. through a long winding tale of events, became a massive sports club. And the lack of that structure in the United States means there's a lack of traditional ties to the community that would be familiar to people that grew up in a football culture. Now, that doesn't mean that the franchises don't have deep roots in their community. I grew up in Tampa. And I I am a huge Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tampa Bay Lightning, and Tampa Bay Rays fan. What I'm talking about here is something like Cowboys, Academy. Mavericks, There's Rangers. There's no academy for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to eventually develop some local lads to go on and one day play for their favorite NFL team. This is a result of the way sports developed in the United States. Now, it did develop at the same time as England or France, for example, but it came up around a different social pillar. While football clubs in those countries were found around different factories or town identities in the United States, sports congregated around something that was already all over the place. The local universities and Education. colleges that blanketed the country. Leagues like the NFL or the NBA were actually formed well after college sports was already a huge attraction right. in America, so they were built on top. Right, which is why you hear me saying it constantly in my reaction videos, why if you want a closer parallel to what you get in European sports or in worldwide sports, look at American college sports. It is... It is more of along the lines of what people experience in other, you know, because you have that attachment to the club. Agreed of the existing infrastructure. That's where the draft comes from. This concept of university players that can no longer play at their university being then drafted into the professional leagues, and it is completely foreign to people that are used to having academies developing their players instead. But it's because those university teams already existed and were hugely popular before the professional ah. leagues ever. There was one. Oh, okay. The 
Okay, he's pointing out something I never I never factored in to my analysis. Our college system way predates our professional league system, our franchise system. So the draft actually does make sense if you think about the fact that we already had those community engagements in our college sports. So if you want the purest form of American sports, it's college sports or high school sports. That's the purest form of any sport that we play because that's where the community, you know, grew around. Ah, it's the, it's the closest parallel. One sport that was so old in the United States that it dodged this. That was baseball, which was founded all the way back in the 1840s and developed a local club system similar to football clubs around the which world. Which used to be and called result, rounders. Each professional baseball team has a large minor league system that it uses to develop players, which looks a lot more similar to an academy than any other American sport. By 1870, universities were already competing against each other in what would become American football, and soccer was not adopted by universities as a sport at the top level until 1950 with the modern rules. Dave Litterer, who maintains the USA Soccer History Archive, said that colleges were playing a hybrid, neither fully soccer nor rugby. But it's only mm. a guess. I don't know, and neither, I think, does anybody else. Perhaps that is a rather unsatisfying answer in this day and age, but history is not an exact science. Now, here he's talking about right. way back in 1870 when American football and soccer looked a lot more similar than they do now. The truth is, none of those early games played by American universities look like American football, rugby, or soccer. Right. The way that those three different sports look today. But eventually the rules of the sport that was played by these university and colleges all over the place were codified and progressed in the direction that would become American football. But what did give the United States continued exposure to the developing rules of soccer was immigration. 25 million Europeans came over to the United States from 1830 to 1930, including 8 million people from the British Isles. As a result, particularly in immigrant communities, the modern rules of soccer were played in a lot of local leagues and clubs. And it was actually out of this crop of players that the United States selected its first World Cup roster for the 1930 World Cup, the first one ever. This team quite amazingly managed to reach the World Cup semi-final by beating Belgium and Paraguay before right. getting smacked by Argentina 6-1, to one, who would go on to lose to eventual champions Uruguay. The tiebreaker from the group stage actually gave the United States a third place finish, which is still the best finish by any team ever from outside of Europe or South America. And the striker on hmm. that team Bert Pattenaud from Fall River, Massachusetts actually made history. He scored the first ever World Cup hat trick against Paraguay. When the players returned back to the United States, there was no cohesive place for them to play. The size of the United States prevented a national league for developing and the university preference for American football meant that these players could only practice at local clubs and various leagues that would pop up and then go away as soon as they seemed to appear. And as a result, after a triumphant performance at the 1930 World Cup, the United States would only play in four more World Cup matches until 1990. Yeah. As other football and cultures around the world were developing leagues. We had that, that long drought, that, you know, that 40 year um, hiatus right there in the middle. Um, man, shout out to Zealand. Uh, I, I've kind of peripherally been a, aware of him as a content creator um, in the football world, but this is such a well-researched video and a, such a well-presented video. This is the kind of content creator I aspire to be. You know, as soon as I can, you know, as soon as I can get full-time doing YouTube and I can break away from doing just strictly reaction videos, this is the kind of video I'd love to kind of, you know, spend the time, research, put it out. Um, but we got to get full-time first. So go ahead smash like on this video and subscribe to the channel if you wouldn't mind it's free for you to do that but it really helps me out by pushing this video on the algorithm and the more views i can get on this channel the more ad revenue i can get on this channel and the more ad revenue i can get on this channel the better the content i can make i'm planning a trip to europe where i can go do on the site more historical documentary style videos talking to players talking to coaches talking to you know, going to museums of the, of the sport, doing podcasts, all kinds of stuff that I want to do with this channel. So if you would, go ahead and smash the like button for me. If this is your first time here, I'm sorry that I interrupted your video for like a minute and a half of rambling, or probably longer.
systems and professionalizing their players to train at a higher level. The United States strategy of just slapping together a team of immigrant or second generation players from local leagues to go play the World Cup just wasn't working nearly as well. There was also this underlying factor, this driving motivation to assimilate into U.S. culture. The rules for association football were viewed as foreign. After all, the United States had its own rules and it had its own sports. The United States mm -hmm. is almost entirely an immigrant nation. Even in the annals of my own personal family history, there are stories of great grandparents that didn't teach their kids their native language from where they came from because of fear of those kids being ostracized. They wanted them to be able to completely assimilate mm. into society and speaking another language wouldn't help them do that, which is ironic right. because now it would be really helpful. But here I am trying to use Rosetta Stone to be able to get back where we started. And with all those cultural and infrastructural factors yeah, working against it and no cohesive plan to try and save association football, it just became something that nobody cared about. It is worth mentioning, though, that the United States did beat England at the 19th. 1950 World Cup in England's first ever World Cup appearance in Brazil. It's considered one of the greatest upsets in World <laughs> Cup history, with the U.S. coach saying before the game that his team were sheep ready to be slaughtered, which is not a motivation <laughs> tactic I'm familiar with. While England's team was obviously full of professional players, everybody on the U.S. team had jobs on the side and was still playing at those small clubs and local leagues. It is absolutely hilarious how unorganized it was compared to today. I mean, the U.S. captain was picked specifically for that game. It was some dude named Ed McIlvaney, who had been born in Scotland, and the reason <laughs> they gave for picking him as the captain in that match was, well, he was British. The guy actually went on to play for Manchester United, by the way. They called him the Yank from the Tail of the Bank. And maybe, just maybe, <laughs> with the idea of the internet and instant communication, this sort of miracle story would have spurned an interest in association football in the United States, the plucky underdogs upsetting favorites England. But none of that existed. In fact, only one American reporter was in Brazil at all, and it's because he decided that he should cover it on his own. He paid for his own trip to Brazil to cover the tournament. It was clear that the United States had settled into association football as a second tier sport. And for 40 years, it stayed that way. The US existed entirely outside of the footballing world. It played Super Bowls while the rest of the world was playing World Cups. But there was actually mm. one very surprising silver lining that saved football in the United States. And that was university sports, actually. And first, this was actually on the women's side of the game, mm. thanks to a law colloquially called Title IX. Title this was IX. a law regarding scholarships for American university and college sports teams. Scholarships being a free ticket to go to school, which can be quite expensive in the United States, in exchange for being a very good athlete playing on one of the sports teams. Well, Title IX said that each college and university had to give out the same number of men's and women's scholarships for sports every year, and it was enacted all the way back in 1972. The problem for schools immediately immediately was all the scholarships right. given out on the American football teams, because that's a sport that's only been played by men at the university level. So there was right. no women's team full of scholarship American football players to balance I it remember out. This, this led a ton of universities and colleges to jump into creating women's soccer teams, because- It makes total sense. I can totally see this. Yeah, because and that's probably why growing up in American culture, a lot of us guys, we viewed soccer as a girly sport. We would, I mean, I, I'm ashamed of it now to think back and think of the way we talked about it. But we, you know, you kind of looked down on your, you know, the guys who played soccer because you're like, that's a girl sport. That's, this makes a, a ton of sense. I, I didn't even think about how Title IX could have affected. Good grief, Zealand. He put the research into this video. Wow. The teams were pretty large and the facilities were relatively cheap, so you could get a lot of scholarships to help balance out your scholarship inequity. The result was a very large apparatus of identifying and developing talented women soccer players before really Makes any sense. other country in the world. And by the time the first Women's World Cup was created in 1991, the United States had created a machine, despite being a non-factor on the men's... Dang! So that's what... That's why they're so... The, our, the U.S. women are so competitive on the world stage and our men really aren't because our men have devoted the better part of a century to actually it's o over a century now i mean when was the nfl merge that was 1970 but they, we were playing we were playing american football far before that so like all of these years have been poured into men playing american football um Obviously, I grew up loving it. I coached it. I played it. 
and I still have a love for it because that's that's that was the path. That's like the golden sport here. And so now I can see totally it makes total sense why our women and the US women are so competitive and such a force in world football and it's because they've actually been pouring the the infrastructure and all of that into uh, developing athletes in that sport I didn't think I never thought about the effect of title nine on this like this is what I love. This is, how, this is how you know that you're reacting to a good video. If you walk away from the video and you're completely thinking differently. Wow. Wow. ...that it just qualified for its first World Cup in 50 years, the United States women won the entire tournament. By 1999, the women's national team had become superstars because the United States was good at it. They won the World Cup in a sold-out Rose Bowl in California. Over 1.1 million people attended that 1999 Women's World Cup. The United States was clearly ready to embrace soccer for the first time as long as the team was winning. After all, the United huh. States is a sucker for a spectacle. And it was through right. star power that the men's Fair side point. of things got its first jolt, its first false start, when Pele signed for the New York Cosmos in 1975, and him and a couple of other famous footballers from days gone by were selling yeah. out American football stadiums because people wanted it's to It's what Messi's doing now. The star-studded NASL yeah. was the United States' first serious attempt at a top-level outdoor professional league, but once the star power departed, the NASL quickly folded back into nothingness. All the while, the grassroots development of American men's players was not kicking on at all. In fact, because of the American mm. football scholarship disparity in Title IX, there are a lot less men's university teams than there are women's university teams. By the time the NASL failed, the American FA knew that it had to do something else, so it launched a wild mm. bid for the 1986 World Cup. And while that bid failed, the United States eventually won the bid for the 1994 Men's mm. World Cup, despite having never qualified for a, a World Cup past too. 1950. And it was at that moment, once again, surprisingly, that universities sports came to the aid of American football. Well, not American football, but like American Association football. I got it. I was bound to mess that up eventually. After all, you. after the NASL disappeared, there was no professional outdoor league. The high amateur level of university soccer on the men's side, as limited as it might be, was the highest level you could play outdoors in the country. The U.S. coach Bob Gansler picked mm -hmm. a team of players fresh out of college to try and make it to the 1990 World Cup in preparation for 94, and those players were given small contracts by the American FA so they could train professionally in preparation. Gansler said of his team, many of them were second generation hmm. immigrants. Their parents and family lives different from an apple pie American ideal. They loved a sport that many around them reviled. That wow. last bit we will come back to later, don't worry. But the qualification for 1990 was huge because there were rumors that if the United States couldn't make a decent showing at the 1990 World Cup, that the 94 World Cup might actually be pulled. And it all came down to a final qualifying match at, get this, Trinidad and Tobago which hadn't lost at home in two years at that point. The National Stadium in Port of Spain was packed, and the United States managed to deliver what was perhaps its most important win ever on the men's side. A stunning strike from Paul Caligiuri gave the Americans a 1-0 win. Putting it in to Caligiuri. Beats the first man. A left-footed shot! Paul Caligiuri has scored a goal! The United States arrived at the 1990 World Cup, its first in 50 years, with a thud, a 5-1 loss against Czechoslovakia. And the next match was against the hosts, Italy, and that match was projected to get wildly out of hand. I mean, why wouldn't it? The United States was essentially a college all-star team with one or two professionals thrown in for spice and flair against mm. a team that had Baresi, Maldini, Baggio. But in wow. a performance, the United Whoa. States only lost Legends. once to nothing. It was a result so surprising that the host nation fans actually booed their star-studded team off the field. It was also a performance that opened doors for Americans in European leagues in a serious way for the first time, with 10 players from that team in 1990 going on to sign contracts to play professionally in Europe. That wow. included John Harkes, the first ever American to play in the Premier League, and recognizable names like Casey Keller. This produced a much more competitive team at the 1990... I need to... Wow. Okay, so I need to do my research on actually Americans that have played at the professional level that are respected because the only ones I know of are Christian Pulisic and uh, oh, what's the blonde headed guy Alexi Lawless I think that's his name Clint Dempsey those are the, those are a few of the only names that I know 
On the, and also the goalkeeper who scored from his own uh, his own net. So those are a few of the only Americans that I know that have actually played at the high, highest level. And so he's naming some names here that are supposed to be recognizable names and uh, tells me that I probably, as an American, should be way more invested in the growth of the sport in our own nation than I am in just purely appreciating everyone else. All right. For World Cup for the United States, where it pulled off a shocking upset of Colombia to actually oh, make it yeah. to the knockout stages in its home World Cup. And that home World Cup coincided with the that founding was the own goal, of MLS, right? which was the first sustainable was professional Andres outdoor Escobar? league in the United States in 1994. Although that wasn't clear immediately because MLS was a bit fledgling in its early years, but was able to build itself up by convincing owners to buy into the league instead of individual teams. But it also was designed to appeal to an American public that was used to franchises in closed leagues. I made an entire video about MLS. I'll link you to it at the end of this video. But the point is, eventually, it developed into a very profitable league mm. structure that could also produce and develop professional players in a way the United States has never been able to do before. But it's still not developing right. players the same way a club in a normal footballing culture would because of university sports. University men's soccer went from a help to get the national team off the ground to a hindrance, often forcing young players to choose between multi-year commitments to play at a university or just going pro out of high school mm. at 17 or 18 years of age. Not to mention the serious issues caused by a lack of football academies in the United States because MLS, which is a closed system, is only going to have 30 teams in it, which means everybody else has to pay for play uh -huh. in the youth systems that they want to participate in. For example, the travel team I grew up playing in ended at U18 because after that everybody just got a job or went to college. There was no senior club attached to it that was playing in like the fourth tier of anything. That doesn't exist. But there was and still is a more significant cultural inertia for or football to overcome yeah. in America. And this brings me back to that comment that the U.S. Yeah, yeah, the cultural inertia. It's a really fantastic way to put it. Man, I like this guy. I feel like I feel like he and I would be able to hang out and we would probably get along really well. Uh, that's an excellent way to put that, a cultural inertia. There is this, like, groundswell of support from Americans for this sport. We're falling in love with it. And it's obvious that we don't know what we're doing when it comes to building the same culture. Like, even if it succeeds here, it's going to be different than it is everywhere else. It's just because it's different here. Um, but there is, and, and he's pointing out some very serious problems, like the pay-to-play problem, which people really, really are upset about. There's, it's not, to me, I don't know an easy way to fix these problems because, and there are multifaceted reasons for all of these. It's not a simple, a lot of my comments, and, and I love my subscribers, I love my my audience, but a lot of my comment sections, um, people put out opinions about American sports, and it's so surface level um, negative and I understand I understand criticizing the way American sports work but it's such a surface level analysis I'm really interested in figuring out why all of these things that have converged to make this this perfect concoction of awfulness why all of these have converged to this point and how we can unravel some of those roadblocks and create something that at least competes with what everyone else is doing. There's no way that U.S. is going to be um, the same kind of footballing nation that other countries are. But there is such a groundswell of attitude from, from people here culturally that we want it to be. Like, we want it to succeed. We want it, we want it to be... So, um, you know, to overtake some of our major sports. And I, I've been honest on this channel. I don't foresee a future in my, in my life. I don't foresee a future in which I will ever stop loving American gridiron football. It's so built into the culture. It's so built into who I am. I played it. I coached it. I love my team, the Dallas Cowboys. I, I'm so invested in that sport. So I don't ever see football overtaking or overshadowing that but i want it to be like i've said 1a and 1b like 
Football is my favorite sport, no matter which form of it we play. Um, man, this is such a fantastic video. I'm kind of a little bit in awe, and I've probably been rambling. If you're new here, you've probably already clicked off and killed my audience retention because I keep rambling. Let's get back into it. This coach made when he was building his 1990 squad, talking about how the sport was reviled. Now, there are no facts here, no quantifiable way to discuss this, but the coach captured a long-held distaste that many Americans felt for soccer when he used the word reviled. Because of how sports and society developed in the United States, as we just talked about, soccer was a foreign sport. It was played by the other. It was un-American. And so the more American you became as an immigrant, the less you played it. And as a result, it became became excluded mm. from the American national ideal. When playing American football, for example, and let's say you weren't playing tough enough to the coach's liking, it wouldn't be out of place to hear the coach say something like, come on, this isn't soccer, stop flopping around. I in the United that. States, we like to think of ourselves as very tough. And American football in particular embodies this. It's a brutally tough sport, and soccer was soft by comparison. This is hard. Also, I'm ready. I, I hear the comments coming. American football is not a tough sport. You have to wear the pads. Bro, let me tell you this much. Those pads and that armor does not make it feel any less brutal, vicious, and violent. I'm telling you, some of the collisions that I had when I played that sport, I would walk away and my ears would be ringing. Like, we we went with, with, with all the force and power. See, rugby is brutal. It is. No joke. It's brutal and your, your body gets beat up. But it's a more fluid sport. There's not so much the... We run very fast, top speed, and we hit each other at top speed. We stop, we call it good, and we start over. And we run as fast as we can, and we hit each other at top speed. It's a, it's a car crash at you know 20 miles an hour for the fast guys. Um, every single play. It's, it's a brutal sport. It hurts. <laughs> It hurts. I've seen stars. My vision's gone. I mean, concussions are no joke. To explain as an American, but we essentially have an inferiority and superiority complex at the same time. We lack the historical precedent and cultural development of many other countries around the world. We know we are rougher around the edges. And as a result, we treat the perceived refinement of these other cultures as a weakness. And that weakness was reflected in the less physical sport that they all played, soccer. And soccer is still now reviled by a portion of the American population for lack of a better word, not being a manly enough sport. But that perception yeah. is changing through my generation and the generation before me. First, it was Dempsey and Donovan, then the generation of Pulisic, Adams, and McKinney. We grew up watching the Premier League on TV on Saturday mornings, playing FIFA online with our friends and learning about the world of football through a screen. And we want that here. Or in the case of our new generation of players, we want to be part of it. A deep cultural understanding of the rules doesn't exist yet, but recognition it's of starting. the sport has increased infinitely from that hard scrabble group of trailblazers back in 1990 to watch the world cup knockout match against the netherlands in 2022 i had to wait outside a bar for two hours at 6 a.m just to get inside and watch the game the 2015 women's world cup final was watched by 27 million americans that's 10 million more americans than english people that watch the and, and you know the sad part about that though is that's a world cup you know, that's that's a such a huge moment. And twenty seven million is still less than an average NF not an average, but when the Dallas Cowboys play an NFL game, we average around thirty million views viewers. Let me check that stat real quick before I just go spewing stuff. Actually, I'm going to let the video play out and then I'll come back. <laughs> English women's team win the European Championship in 2022. In a Washington Post poll after the 2022 World Cup, 8% of Americans said that soccer was their favorite sport, just a few percentage points behind baseball and basketball. And among Americans under 30, soccer had passed baseball in that same poll. So Easy. yes, we sucked for a long time, but the reasons why are changing. And even though football in the United States will always look and feel different because of the way it was formed, 
American football, American association football will never be lost in the darkness again. Thank you to Isaiah, our research partner in this piece. And if you want to read or watch any of the sources we used for this entire video, they're all down in the description. If you want to watch that MLS video I was talking about, it's a beginner's guide. What a fantastic freaking video. Zealand is my new inspiration for the kind of content creator that I want to be. Oh my word. And also, if people have been asking, yeah, football manager, I'm trying to figure out how to make that content. I'm technically challenged. Um, all right, let's look at um, Dallas Cowboys average viewers, viewership. All right. Yeah, that's crazy. For one NFL team. For one NFL team, which is my team. <laughs> the team that I love with all of my heart, all of my passion. Um, they average 22.6 million views. The Women's World Cup, 27 million. So... I'm trying to decide if that's that saying something bad about our our support of the women's team, or if that's just saying that the Dallas Cowboys are a freaking legit uh, rating superstar, which probably is both probably both are true. But you know there are games I remember there have been big primetime games that we play throughout the season, and 30 million people will watch the game, and so that kind of shows you that even Americans who aren't a, a fan of my team are watching my team play NFL games. So I, I'm, I'm almost positive the average NFL game is quite a bit lower than the Cowboys, though. So I'm not sure how much. This This probably, I'm just going to end the video because this is nonsense. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm sorry I went off on this little viewership rant at the end. I'll see you guys in the next video.